I was thinking to you know, construct my, my comments through the stories. And, uh, but you know, coming, walking from my apartment to here, I came up with some ideas of how can I frame this, what I want to say. So there is some framework, because we are children of enlightenment, and we need these uh, maps uh, that we cling to often. And in my seminar experience, it was almost, how to say, all the time was people selling you maps on, <laughs> on, on how things work out and what life is about. And we were drowning in maps in the seminar. A map of this theologian, a map of that theologian, everybody had a bird's eye view of things and tried to um, sell us on how actually the real world really works. Uh, but I think there's a reaction to that whole approach, and you can see more and more theology being stored to poetry, uh, uh, poetic theology, but also to stories. Because stories are a reaction to overcoding of our beliefs. Uh, when you have a map, the whole space is homogenized, okay? And parted in same sizes and squares and rectangles. And you can see everything at once which doesn't correspond to life. Not everything is homogeneous. Uh, you cannot see everything at once. You always see things from a point of view. Uh, because every point of view is viewed from a point. So I think there is a thirst in all of us towards seeing our faith through itineraries instead of maps. Itineraries in the past were, were acted stories, acted truths. Here I stopped, here I prayed, here I got food, here I crossed the river, here I did this. When you have itineraries, you communicate, but you don't have you don't have land to defend. You don't have areas to prove. There is you tell your story and there's nothing to defend. And it has authority on its own because I have been there and done that. And perhaps in the past people through itineraries uh, were much more attuned to the fact that the universe is made of stories. Uh, atoms, they make molecules which makes things which produce words, and then words produce sentences, and sentences produce stories, and stories are reality. Sort of this are reality that I live for, and a lot of us live for, and as Orr said, we are in search of these narratives. So, I myself saw biblical stories as stories that were uh, authorized. They come to me with authority, and I am to interpret them and then uh, perhaps break them into propositions <laughs> and then live according to those propositions. It is only 20 years after in ministry that I look back and I say, no. <laughs> I am called to speak back to my text. I have been handed these stories from brothers and sisters and friends and enemies and people known and unknown from the past. And now I'm here to speak back. And I say, my text, my theology, my scripture, I regret that this is not in the text, and I'm adding it to the text. And I thought this is complete heresy, I cannot do that, in a seminar I couldn't talk like this, until I met some rabbis, <laughs> who completely allowed me to do this thing. And I would never allow myself to do things, no pastor would allow me to do that thing, but I was explained by the rabbis that you honor the text by engaging in a relationship with it. You make it bigger and deeper, and you take more, more, make it more authoritative if you speak back to it. And so that's one way I was affected by people from other faith to see it that way. Um, so those are my, uh, you know, first comments. I have uh, a lot of other things in, in mind to share, but let's see where where discussion takes us. <laughs>